so he's looking forward to getting together and getting to know each other a little better. Huge part of uh, huge part of life in Christ. All right, so this morning I felt like there was going to be a lot of distractions. A lot of us are kind of coming in with some stuff and whatnot. Um, so who's ready to hear some good news? Something that God's doing now, not not just something He did before. Yeah, well, Chad, Shan, if you'd be willing to come up and share a little testimony about the goodness of God, what He's doing. He's up to lots of good things, actually, but, um, yeah, thank you for being willing to share. <laughs> Morning, everyone. So, when Chad and I got baptized recently, we have had the worst luck, and I don't even mean that in the lightest way. I feel like we have had nothing but a horrible spiritual attack on all of us, our family members, anything you can imagine has been happening to us. So, we want to tell you guys how we got through it. So... We were talking about getting baptized, and before getting baptized, we had a plan to get out of a lot of debt by June, and it's almost June, and we're not even close to that. So I told her, we're going to get baptized, we're going to be under a spiritual attack. I don't want you losing your faith, and don't let me lose mine, because she says I have a hot temper. I don't know what she's talking about. (laughs) But anyways, we got our tax refund. And Saturday, I put that all on bills because we were able to use our credit card for bills. Sunday, we get baptized. Monday comes, bills come in. We can't use the credit card for bills. And we've already spent most of our paycheck on other things that we needed. <coughs> so now we're trying to find money on where to, what are we going to do to pay our bills? Well... I looked at Shannon, and we, we were sitting there probably Tuesday, Wednesday night watching one of our one of our favorite pastors, not our favorite pastor, don't <laughs> tell Steve, but uh-huh. we were watching one of them on TV, and she, she gets up and goes to the bathroom, and the pastor wasn't talking anything about tithing and offering, and tithing and offering is something I keep talking to Shannon about, and she goes, okay, whenever we're able to, we're going to. We need to pay these bills. We need to pay those bills. We need to have a roof and food for our kids. Right. I'm sure God understands that. But at the same time, I kept harping on it. But we never had the money to. Well, she goes to the bathroom, and all of a sudden, the pastor switches to tithes and offerings. And he's saying that he was talking to a friend, and a friend said, we changed it all. Instead of tithing on our net pay, we tithe on our gross pay, and okay, a lot of us probably do that. He's like, but we didn't just stop there. If we went to the store and we got something on sale, we tithed on what we saved on that sale. If we got a gift, we tithed on that gift. And I sat there for a couple minutes watching this, and I told Shannon when she came out, I was like, listen to what this guy said. And we watched it, and it was a good 15 minutes of tithes and offering, and Basically, anything they saved on was money in your pocket, and that's what they tithed on, including giving the offerings off of their gross pay. I said, well, we don't have the money for bills, but we do have the money for tithes and offerings, so I think this is a good sign saying that that's where we should start. So we started doing that, and come this month, we are again trying to get our bills paid, figure out what money we had left, and her car was already paid. Didn't know anything on it. Before that, we had my car that was paid, and they took it out of the wrong bank account, so that came back with an extra $29, and I was starting to stress out about that whenever I found her car was already paid, which made up for all of it plus some. So, we aren't out of debt yet, but we're doing a whole lot better than what we were doing ever since we started doing the tithes and offerings. So that's where we're at. We do it on everything. If someone buys us a meal, we look at how much that meal costs and we do the offerings on that. Every, literally everything that we possibly could have. But like we got hit with those medical expenses from him having to have stitches on his second birthday. We looked into having someone help us with that because that was, we took him to an event center and that was the event center's fault why my son ended up getting injured and needing four stitches. 
we didn't know where that money was going to come from to pay the bill. The bill is not, it's covered. The insurance didn't even need a deductible. We don't know how that happened, but everything that has happened is happening wonderfully for us now. And it's been ever since, you know, we put it all up to God. Like, I was arguing with Chad because he was picking up a lot of doubles and not home with the family. And I said, well, God would want you home with the family, help raise these kids that, you know, we made together. His paycheck came, he had one double on it, and it was like, I don't know, two times what it should have been. And he got a pay increase. We don't, everything's happening for us right now. So this is a very important thing for us to share with you guys. Yeah. Awesome. Can we pray for you guys, too? <laughs> All right. Well, God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord. And we thank you for the Dolan family, for putting their faith in you, not just in water baptism, but putting you first in their finances, Lord. I thank you for their faith and putting you first in everything. And for your goodness and faithfulness, God, to provide for their every need above and beyond. And I pray right now, Lord... That every spiritual attack against their family would be canceled. Every assignment against them would cease. That, Lord, your covering would now come over them. And all that stress and frustration and, and anger, Lord, that's even been coming out, Lord, that, that would all dissipate. And that your peace would rule their household in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you for being willing to share. Woo. God's good. Put it, you know, I, I love it. This is, that's actually one of the few, I think it's the only area where God said, put him to the test. Put him to the test and see what he'll do. Right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I think God is waiting on us to give him something to work with. Right? He wants to bless. Remember, we learned about that last week. Last week was a little rough. We learned about sin. Yeah, God will forgive you. But God wants to bless you, not just forgive you. Man, he is so good. And, and when we give our tithes and offerings, what that does is it breaks the curse of our finances. And then all of a sudden, where enough was never enough before, it's working. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. Or you know, plus, it's, it's awesome how faithful he is. In fact, I recently skipped a, a payment for my friend Dell, and Becky was like, you, you know what you're doing? Better not get that paid back up, right? I love it. We need accountability. So, I guess you want to go back to children's church? Yeah? All right. Well, have at it then. You're at least the kiddos back to children's church. I can, she was on the edge of her seat. Couldn't wait for it. You guys have an awesome time together. We're going to dive into the Word. Into the Word. So, we're, we're continuing through this message series about cleaning house. Something that nobody wants to do. But everybody wants to have done. And it is nice to kick back in a clean, organized home. I even love the smell of a clean house, you know. And um, what we're looking at is the parallel spirit. How do I clean this mess of a house up? Because I can't do it on my own. I need a helper, right? So we learned last week a little bit about what sin is. Is and just how desperately we need a healthy relationship with the Holy Spirit. Keep us hitting those bullseyes one after the next after the next because it's so easy to miss it. And oh my goodness, do we miss it? You know, I don't know about you all, but sometimes, like, I know I'm it's not like you're doing anything wrong, you know, but you just feel like you're just going through motions. You know, there's a huge difference between. When you do something and you nail it and you know that God's with you, you know that God's for you and you see his blessing on it. In fact, even, even if you don't see his blessing, if you go through adversity and you know that God is with you and for you, you can do it. Oh, it gives you strength to endure it. But when you're just going through motions of life and don't feel his, his anointing, his blessing on it, it's a huge difference. You can be doing things but still sinning. Missing the point, missing your mark. Um, as we learned, you know, having, indulging in the flesh, Galatians 5. You know, I've read through so many times the fruits of the flesh versus the fruits of the spirit. And Galatians 5 starts and is telling us not to indulge in the flesh. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's just, you know, you know, giving in every now and then. 
But what that word literally means is that you are setting up a command center, a base of operations in war, a place from which a movement or an attack is made. So when you indulge in the flesh, you're doing way, way more than just giving into a guilty pleasure. You know, you're actually setting up a base war against you so we start looking at sin a little differently <laughs> a little bit of the way that god sees reality in the spiritual realms so this morning god wants to shift our thinking about sin even a little more we typically think about sin as doing what god told us not to do we learned about this last week for this is the loophole right if the bible doesn't explicitly tell me not to do something we're good right okie dokie you know, and, and so we see just how, how far can I go on this line before I slip and fall, right? You know, you love to live, live life on the edge, you know, where I'm not sinning, you know. Like, you know how your toddlers do when you tell them not to touch something and they're like, you know. <laughs> That's what we still do. We just, it looks different, but we still ain't grown up, right? So we, we have a tendency to think that. If the Bible doesn't explicitly call something out as sin, then we use this justification of, well, we're he's good with it. You know? Our flesh is always looking for loopholes to enable us to do whatever we want to do, and yet still okay with God. Still we're all right, you know, and we're good with him. Our flesh tempts us to find that line between righteousness and sin and to dwell right there on the line. Now, where does that are for us to do? back in the refuge and safety of his covering, right? And the Spirit is always looking to give us a full and abundant life where we can experience this life to its fullness. That's what the Spirit wants to do. But we can't experience the full abundant life in sin. The Spirit wants us to dwell in a safe refuge. But going back to what sin is, God does not define every single way that you can miss it. I mean, he just... It's not possible. <laughs> we are very creative. Very creative. So God doesn't define all the countless ways that we can miss his target. Instead, he makes clear to us what his bullseye is. And then anything outside of that, that's sin. So we think about sin a little differently here. It's not just of do nots. It's understanding God's design and purpose for something. Then anything outside of that is sin. Anything outside of that. I mean, you know, I've used this example out how many times, you know. Craftsmen, they had a design between the uh, flat screwdriver, right? They have a design and a purpose. And its design and purpose was for tightening and loosening flathead screws. But, I mean, who here has only used their flat screwdriver for that purpose? I don't think anybody has. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a nice wedge and you pry on it, you know. You start using it for any other purpose, and what ends up happening? You literally sinning against it. It wasn't made for that. Not only is it probably going to be damaged, I don't know how many <laughs> flat screwdrivers I have at home, and when I actually need to tighten or loosen the flathead, it's like, meh, 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 you know, because the shaft's all bent, and you can never put it back the way it's supposed to be, right? You damage it. I've also done this many times. I've damaged myself cry and use a screwdriver when the thing snaps and you bust your knuckles against it, right? It was uniquely designed and intentionally created for a purpose. When you use it for that purpose, it's not typically going to go well. Eventually, you're going to get hurt. So God has a design and a purpose for everything. A design and a purpose for communication with each other, for friendships with one another. He has a design and a purpose for music, for marriage, for sex. God created sex. He created it awesome. That's why we're shy about it. You know? he, he's the one that has a purpose behind it. He has a design and a purpose for work, for education, for Ecclesiastes 3. To everything under the sun. There's a time, a season, and a purpose. God is the designer. I mean, he has a purpose behind everything that he does. Nothing that God ever does is accidental. He never does something and he's like, whoa, <laughs> didn't expect that. You know, he's never surprised by anything. Never. God is a God of purpose. And that means that you were created on purpose and for a purpose. Even if your circumstances may have been a little bit surprising to your parents or 
even if you don't even know who your parents are, God knows you, and he knows your purpose. So one of the first house cleaning tasks is to recognize what is in need of cleaning. What's in need of cleaning? What's dirty? What's out of place? What just needs to be thrown out because you're never going to use it? You know, what needs to be brought in? Things that you need. What areas of my life have been affected by sin and need to be cleansed or just need to be renewed? What do I need to talk out of my life and what do I need to put in it? Right? So when we know and we understand God's purpose and his design for our lives, then you can quickly identify anything that doesn't fit. Anything that's not right. That, that's how you, you clean the house by knowing how the house should look, you know? The shoes don't belong in the middle of the living room floor. Why? There's a reason for that. Because you're going to trip and fall, and it's just it's not good. And, you know, and then there's a muddy path this time of the year leading to the middle of the floor where somebody kicked their boots off, you know? Because, oh, I shouldn't be walking in here with my shoes on. Ain't, anybody else does that? <laughs> okay, just me. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. That's how we understand what sin is. What's out of place? What needs cleaned? You know, what are some things that are missing that, that I need in my life? Is to understand the purpose behind things. So to recognize we, we need to get to know God. He's the one who created us. And so I need him to reveal those things to me. I need God to show me, not only for my own life. Like we, we have a tendency to get lost in the forest of the big picture of our lives. When in reality, God cares more about the little things. Just do this right. And when you do all the little things... You find yourself right in the center of God's plan and purpose on the big scale for your life. God cares about the little things because it's those things that keep you on path for the big purposes of your life. Think about, man, pick anyone in the Bible. Anyone. You know, Joseph obviously always comes to mind for me of all the hardships and difficulties he went through. But he said in the end that God has a purpose for good, through, even through all the rough stuff. God has an intent for it. Um, but not just for our lives, but God has a, an intent for everything. He has a design and a purpose for me. And when we do it the way he calls us to, then we're blessed. And when we don't, we're not. <laughs> you know, and it's no different than everything else in our lives. For food. You know, God created the body for food. And when you manage it well, you know, it's good and you're healthy. And when you don't manage it well and you a, a garbage collector or garbage disposal, you know, it doesn't go very well for you. And sorry, I keep looking down. I'm not saying I'm having any conviction right now or anything, you know. But my goodness, God has a purpose for everything. Absolutely everything. Are you using it for its intended purpose or not? God knows and he will reveal those things. Think about this example, a fire. A fire is a wonderful thing. In our fireplace on a cold winter night. I love a fireplace or, you know, around the fall, sitting around, you know, a fire with your friends and family. You got a fire ring going, you know, and everything. It's an awesome thing. Cuddling up, you know, next to a fire in a fireplace. A fire, it's an unnecessary, irritable thing if it's in your fireplace, but on a hot summer day, right? It's the same fire. It's the same fireplace. But if you got it going in the wrong time wrong season it's not comforting it's annoying and irritable and a fire in the middle of the living room floor is horrifying anytime any season if it's out of place and it's the exact same fire the fire is not sin depending on when and where it's placed <laughs> do you see that's why it's, it's really hard for god to define all all the ways to miss it that sin. Instead, he says, here's a place. Season. Put two and two together, and guess what? <laughs> God has a design and a purpose and a place for that thing. And if you take it anywhere outside of your life, well, it's a bad thing. Like, I showed my little five-year-old nephew how you can hold a, fi hold a stick in the fire long enough to, you know, set it ablaze. And then you can run around with it, and it, 
it's cool, look at smoke, you know, and, and then he's like, ha, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, oh goodness, anyway. so for everything there's a proper time, a proper season, a proper purpose, 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 what this is all about, if you think about sin in such a consequential way, in life, but if you think about sin as God is a purpose, God is a purpose. Am I fulfilling it? Am I using things in my life for their intended purpose? Or am I sinning and missing it? To get things out of order when it comes to times or seasons or to misunderstand the purpose is to sin to miss the mark. Um, now, right now is the season for, for tilling and fertilizing and planting, right? If you wake up tomorrow and that garden that you finally finished planting, if tomorrow you wake up and decide... It's harvest time. Not going to go very well for you, is it? That, that little, it's going to still look like that seed of corn or that, that seedling, like, probably doesn't even have eyes. Oh, I mean, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it if you don't patiently wait for the right time. You're going to sin by uprooting, and you're never going to get the harvest that you could have had. Does in lives, you uproot something that God wanted to bless and grow. You uprooted it, and so it can never become the blessing that God intended for it to be in your life. Not because there's anything wrong with that seed, but because you didn't discern the time and the season, and you uprooted something when it was not the season of harvest. Sometimes you just got to plant those seeds and let them go. Stop poking. People don't like poked in life. I found this out early in my life when I was first saved, you know. You know, just we're seed scatterers. Seed scatterers. Just scatter the seed, give it time to grow. Because who's the one that makes things grow? The scriptures. God alone. You can't make it grow by poking at it and digging it back up all the time. Okay? Just, okay, so your prodigals, just give them space, give them time, let them make their mistakes. As now the father did, they came running back home. Be patient. Let God do his work. All right, so that's a prophetic word for somebody. Anyways, how do we recognize what time and season we're in, though? Whew. Whole series for a lifetime. How we recognize it. How we recognize what's dirty in our lives that needs clean spiritually. How we recognize what's out of place in our priorities that needs organization. How we recognize what things need to let go of and what things we need to gather together in our lives. How do we recognize these things? How do we recognize these things? Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 1, 9 to, 6, 9 to 16? Yeah. It says this. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? I'm just going to say this applies to absolutely everyone, whether you're young or not. But when you're trained in it when you're young, you will follow through with it the rest of your days, right? Isn't that what, what the Proverbs teach us? Is to set the course of a young person. How do you keep yourself on that path of purity? Hitting the bullseye, hitting the bullseye, hitting the bullseye. By living according to your word. God gave us his word for everything. He, the author goes on and says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Right? Just like that, that, that arrow being shot, straying away is to sin. It's literally what sin means. is that bullseye, that target. Don't let me stray away. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Probably the biggest key right here, this key verse right here. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach my de me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, I meditate on your precepts. I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. And I will not neglect your word. Someone, this is, I think it's an acrostic. You know, this is the letter B. B the letter B. But what awesome verses to keep us from sin is to know God's word, to seek him with all of our heart. 
and not just to like, oh, what do, I, what do I need to do? You know, and you flip through God's word. To have his word hidden in your heart so that you just immediately know how to walk this life and how to live this life. When you understand something's purpose, then when you're handed something, you don't have to be like, what is this thing? And what in the world am I supposed to do with it? Um, I, I like on Facebook, there's a lot of memes that float around, you know, of some of us old schoolers, I guess I'm becoming, which is sad because I don't feel old at all. But, you know, they, these teens, you know, what is this thing? And they're like, ah, no it's like, it's a telephone, come on. You will never know the pleasure of slamming that phone when you're angry. Because it cracks and breaks and, you know. <laughs> You'll never know <laughs> all these devices that, you know, this generation looks at and they have no idea what the heck it's for, you know? <laughs> There's, oh, I could go on and on and on anyways. You got to go back to the designer. He knows the purpose. And once you know what it's for, because you're trained ahead of time. You hid his word in your heart. You hid his purpose. You know and you understand. Lord teaches us his precepts and his reveals his purpose for everything in this life. Notice that we're not just supposed to read and to know God's word. We've hidden God's word in our minds, but where are we supposed to hide it? Hearts. Hidden his word in our hearts. It begins in your mind. You can't just shut something straight into your heart. I wish that you could, but you can't. It's got to go in the mind. But a drop you know it's, it's a common saying that many people miss heaven by 18 inches right head to the heart they know god. well they know about god about god they know his word they can quote it but it never transforms their heart it never changes their heart it never changes their lives knowledge about god is the same as knowing god they're two different things People can know all things, all kinds of things about my wife, whether it's, you know, good, bad, true, or a liar, indifferent, but, you know, but I know her. And as soon as I hear something, I know whether that's her or not. I know God, know his plan and purposes for everything. Then you won't see it because you understand the reason that God gave you something, the purpose behind it. In order to know what a clean house of a life looks like, we've got to know his word. His word tells us. It's his blueprint for life. That's what his word is. Not only is it his blueprint for life, but his word is full of people who said every single person, aside from Jesus, in the word of God missed it. And the Bible records it. It's light. Shows you how they missed it. Shows you the pain they experienced because of it. Shows you how God got to help it. Good anyways. That's every story in the Bible. And those are historical accounts. Not bedtime stories. Historical accounts. Real people with real faith. And real struggles and real doubts. Who made some real big messes in their life. I mean you can't get any worse than going around killing Christians. And that's what Saul was doing when God got a hold of him. And turned his life around oh man and that should give us hope yeah i might have screwed it up and yeah i'm hurting see i think the biggest thing that gets between us and god's purposes is pain when we had our hope set on something and it was something good and it was something that god taken away or it didn't work out the way we expected it to and it's so hard to dare to hope again. To dare to get your hopes up. Because you'll experience that pain again. But I believe this morning, God wants to heal all that pain. Restore all that has been lost. And he wants to dare you. To dare you, as Sharon shared. To hope in him again. We all need to hide God's word in our hearts. And with all of our heart to seek him. All of your heart. Man, that's a... That, that little three-letter word is a big one. All your heart. God's word is a light to our path so that even when we don't know which way we ought to go, it lights, 
each decision to keep us going on the right path. We walk confidently with the Lord because we're seeking him. We don't have to fumble around in the dark not knowing where we need to go. God's word is a light. And it may not shine all the way down there to what you want to see, but God's light will shine where you need to step next, to keep in step with the Spirit. That's what Galatians 5 teaches us, right? To keep in step, step by step with the Spirit. Don't worry about the long haul marathon once down the road. Just worry about the next step of faith. And that's discipleship. Jesus saying, follow me. One step of the way. In fact, the Bible tells us that when we're seeking him, we're going to hear his voice behind us telling us what? This is the way. All right? For, for all my Mandalorian anyone? Yeah. This is the way. Walk in it. Knowing God through personal relationship helps us to know who we are in him. It emboldens us to say yes to some things and the wisdom to say no to others. So often we say yes to something just because it's good. But is that what God wants us to do? It may seem right to us. Our family and friends may agree with it. But is it what God is calling you to do? It gives us wisdom to say no to things so that we can say yes to the best things, the things that God has planned for us. We understand our own strengths and weaknesses and our own limitations so that we can dwell safely within them. God keeps us from sinning, from missing his purpose. Knowing God who fully knows you. Knowing who we were created to be. Knowing the purpose for which we were designed. These are what keeps us from sinning against God. From sinning against others. And as we're going to learn in the end here, even sinning against ourselves. Yes, the consequences of all sin are the same. But there's one specific sin it's a little different than others. Hang in there, it's coming. I swear it's a short message today. I'm, I know. Knowing these things is what kept Jesus focused and free of sin. Knowing God, knowing his purpose. Through relationship. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him. This is what equipped Jesus to resist and to refute the temptation. Knowing his purpose. This is what emboldened Jesus to rebuke Peter when Satan was using him and tempted him, right? When Peter said, no, never, you will never die. Jesus like, get behind me, Satan. Woo! That's pretty bold. I've been called Satan before, so I, I know how Peter feels. I'll boast in that. <laughs> it was actually while I was standing here from somebody. That was, that was a fun day, if anybody remembers it. Anyways, woo! But Jesus knew and he often spoke out who he was. Think about it. Jesus said, I am the son of God. I am the son of man. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. He knew who he was. And he spoke it out. It's, you know, people think you're crazy when you speak about yourself in the third person. But Jesus did it pretty often. Speak about yourself. I am. Know who you are. Remind people who you are. Remind yourself who you are. Jesus knew, and he often spoke out the purpose for which he came. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the Lord. I came to lay down my life as a ransom for many. I came to do this. I came to, came to set the captive free. Came to heal the blind. Think about these things. He would speak them out. Why are churches so quiet? And he spoke out about who he was and why he was here often. Jesus held firmly to his identity as a son. As a son. And if we've received his free gift of salvation, which you ought to do that today if you haven't yet. I don't know what you're waiting for. You're missing out on some really good stuff. Then we are also children of God. You are a child of God. So you could declare that about yourself as well. We've been adopted into his family. More important than any other role that you can fulfill. Whether you are a teacher, pastor, apostle, prophet. Uh, I got them all out of order. So what's the fifth one? Evangelist. I think I got them. Uh, 
You know, whether you're a servant, an encourager, whether you're administrative or whatever your gifting is, more important than any other role you can ever have is a child of God. That's where we need to find our identity. We need to find our identity in who we are, not in what we do. And in America here, that's what we do, right? We first figure out, what do you do? <laughs> I think Lisa not long ago, right? That's the first thing you talk about. But what we need to value and what we need to place our identity in is not what we do, but who we are. You're a child of God. And nobody can take that away from you. They can take anything else away from you, but they cannot steal your identity. Right? Identity theft isn't a joke, Jim. But no one can steal your identity. I, I like to test the waters and see who all stands the things that I'm fans of, you know. Anyways. Identity is a ch- Because think about this. Every one of the gifts of the Spirit, every, every amazing thing that God equips us to do, once you're in heaven, appears. There's no need for any of the gifts of the Spirit. No need for healing. There's no sickness or disease. No need for prophecy or words of knowledge or wisdom because everybody knows everything. Now we only know in part. Um, you know, I, I could go on and on and on and on. So if you identify with your gifting, you're going to be very disappointed when you get to the kingdom. But if you identify as a child, then not only can nothing shake you here because you know who your daddy is, but when you get to the oh my goodness, the homecoming. You're among family. You got brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't enjoy your brothers and sisters if you're at home watching on, you know, your your phone or TV. Man, but I get to know my crazy brothers and sisters here and, you know, flaky and nutty as some of them might be. I get to enjoy living life together with them. Church. Oh, it's an amazing, awesome thing. Amazing, awesome thing. So we got to find our identity first and foremost in who we are. After we realize who we are, then we move on to our purpose. We were designed and created. That's why some things are sin for me and not for you. I was created for a different purpose than you were. And you were created with different I don't have. That's why some things are sin for you and not for me. That's why we can't black and white everything. You just can't. To fulfill the law and the prophet. To give his life as the ransom for many. To save the law. To give us an abundant and eternal life. To bring fire on the earth. I love that one. Jesus said, I came to bring fire. I didn't come to bring vision. I, called to, I was brought, come to bring a separation. Who are my sheep and who are those wolves? Whew. He came to bring revelation to truth. And he speaks to truth. He came to bring light into darkness. To reveal the kingdom of heaven and to reveal the kingdom of darkness. Jesus came walking into town, and guess what the demons did? What are you doing? It is too early for you to be here. To torment us now. <laughs> they know who they are, and they know what their destiny is. How much more do us as children know who we are and know what our destiny is and respond to the presence of God and respond to the word of God? the voice of Jesus. Whew. Jesus struggled, but he said, not my will, but your will be done, right? Jesus often spoke these things out so there'd be no confusion and no doubt about who he was, why he came to the earth, and he let people decide for themselves. You're either with me or for me. He didn't sweat it. He didn't get stressed out about whether he had followers or not, whether he had likes or not, whether people were, whatever it is now, is it instead of retweeting now. I don't know if they read that. <laughs> Jesus didn't care about this. He cared about one thing. His father's opinion. Will. He lived in an audience of one. And so ought we. So ought we. But how often we verbally speak who we are. <laughs> My kid. I'm your father. Right? <laughs> we got... <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. I've been yelling at a lot lately. You know? <laughs> Not in this house. 
house. <laughs> in this house, we, you know, right? That's how you ought to be. Not in this kingdom. This kingdom, we do this, this, and this. We do not do this, you know? I mean, we just are speaking it out. Speak it out. So there's no confusion. And you know what? If you got to stand in the mirror and do it, stand in the mirror and do it. Nate, could I have you hand these out? Stand in the mirror the next time you are a blubbering, blubbering mess and you got no idea what you're supposed to do. Stand in that mirror and tell yourself who you are. And let me tell you, it changes things. It changes things quickly when you start declaring what God says about you. Now, Jesus needed to do it how often? Did he? Knowing, 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 knowing God's word, knowing him through relationship. It equips us to know and to understand his design and purpose for everything to avoid sin. It equips us to live out full and abundant lives as they were intended to be lived. Knowing who we are in Christ, who he says you are. It enables us to understand who we are in Christ. Knowing who we are in Christ enables us to understand our purpose for life. And my purpose is the same as your purpose. There's going to be a lot of overlap. We were all created to worship. We were all created in the image of God. You know, we were all created to serve others. There's a lot of overlap. But there are some things that are unique. We're all parts of the body of Christ. And they're all very unique from one another. Knowing that we have been uniquely created and gifted for a purpose, it gives us boldness. You know what the enemy does throughout, like, the enemy loves to do this, especially throughout, like, grade school. What is different about you? Usually you try to hide it. You're ashamed of it. What makes you unique from other people? Because that's usually what people point and laugh at. Like, I was never very tall. You know, throughout grade school, and I still aren't very, I'm very tall right now. So, sorry, Nate, you got no hope. But, um, <laughs> you know, so, it, it being tall. We're tall this way. It's tall that way. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it happens, and then you're like, you're ashamed of yourself, and you want to change yourself. No, no, no. In the kingdom of God, he wants to break off all shame. He wants to break off all condemnation. So the things that are unique about you are what shine. Those things that are unique about you are what give you a purpose. Because it's different from everyone else, and it's okay to be different. God had a purpose behind it. He didn't make no accident. He didn't make no mistake. He has a purpose behind your uniqueness. It gives us confidence, and it frees us from fear. Helps you to shake that fear off. We don't need to memorize some long list of thou shalt not. Free from sin. We just need to know who we are, what our purpose is, and what the purpose for all things in our lives serve. Then whatever falls outside of it is sin. In fact, Jesus memorized the entire law and prophets of the Old Testament into these two, right? Isn't that really cool? The whole Old Testament summarized in two things. God love us. Jesus said if you do these two, if you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and if you love others the way you love yourself, then you've done it. You're fulfilling all of the Old Testament, all the law, all the prophets. You got it. So instead of memorizing everything we're not supposed to do, memorize what you are supposed to do. And do it. And do it. If you get those right, then you automatically avoid sin. And you don't have to worry about sin. Or be afraid of where to walk because you might be in sin. You can shake that fear off and just confidently be who you were called to be. Now, especially in America, we love our freedom, we love our rights. We do, and we should. The cool thing is, in Christ, you are even freer than the American government lets you be. And you're going to start seeing that even more and more. <laughs> Whew. You've been given a freedom that no one can steal away. No law can ever be legislated against you as a Christian. Don't be afraid when they take your rights away, whatever. Let them do it, because your rights don't come from no government. They come from the kingdom. Yeah. Kingdom of God, right? You have freedom. You're free to do anything you want to do. God has given you the freedom to sin. We learned last week, he's not afraid of sin. He doesn't hide and run and, ew, you're icky, you know? It's not like food to God. God pursues us in sin. 
Look at the garden account. He went chasing down Adam and Eve in their sin. And then he killed an animal and covered it in shame. I mean, he's not afraid of sin. He defeated it. What he's concerned about is, like we talked about last week with Cain, it wants to have you. Are you going to just ex- defeat? Or are you going to be a victor? Are you going to rule over it? Or are you going to become a slave and let it rule over you? Because it's one or the other when it comes to sin. Either you rule it or it rules you. One or the other. God gives us freedom. In fact, we read about this freedom in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what I'm ending on. Paul said, you say, I have the right to do anything. But not everything's beneficial. You say, I have the right to do anything. Paul said, but I won't be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food. (laughs) Well, God's going to destroy them both. The body was not meant for sexual immorality. The body was meant for the Lord. And the Lord was meant for the body. Is that cool to think about? We dwell in him and he dwells in us. And together we're happy. We dwell in him and he dwells in us. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. It's so cool to think about. In verse 14 it says, By God's power he raised the Lord from the dead. And he will raise us also. There's another word of encouragement. By his power. Not by your power and your strength and your wisdom. By his power he's going to raise you from the grave. Lift you up from the pit. Set your feet on rock. Out of that miry clay, right? Said in verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Your bodies are members of Christ himself. Should I then take a member of the body of Christ and unite it with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that when you unite yourself with a prostitute, you become one in body? It said the two will become one flesh. But whoever's united with the Lord... Is one with him in spirit. So which are you going to be united with? In verse 18. The answer for sexual morality. Flee from it. (laughs) Flee. All other sin a person commits is outside the body. But whoever sins sexually. Sins against their own body. That's why this is such a hot topic. Not only in the culture. But it's something. It's nothing new under the sun. Are you kidding me? Look at all the cultures who fell before. This is nothing new. They were living those lifestyles. We can't invent anything that is new. Even these 5,000 genders they come up with, you know. We think that's something new, and there's nothing new under the sun. But Paul wrote, went on, and he said, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. That's why this empty cross is up here to remind us the price that was paid and the fact that he's alive, he ain't there anymore. You were bought Christ. Therefore, what are we supposed to do with these bodies? Honor God. Honor God. Honor God with our bodies. Okay? We're flat screwdrivers. We are not wedges. We are not levers. Okay? Don't be misusing your bodies. Honor God with them. So, now we know how to recognize sin as sin, right? Nate, you know how to recognize sin as sin. Could you hand these out? This is going to help you to find your unique purpose. Your unique purpose that God created you for. How awesome is that? Has anybody ever wondered, why am I here? Whoa, why am I the way I am? I, you ever look in the mirror and ask yourself that? That's going to help you to understand it. That's going to help you to understand it. And so in closing, we're going to take time to pray. And if I could have the worship team come forward, we're going to do the one thing that we were all created to do. Whether you do it well or not, doesn't matter. God is pleased with it. He loves that noise that comes from you. But think about that. Oh, think about that. If Jesus had to consistently proclaim with his what how did jesus proclaim who he was and what he was here to do he spoke it he used his mouth use your voice 
I know y'all got voices, and I know all y'all can get pretty loud, right? So I want you to take that same intensity when you're infuriated about the wrong that was done, and I want you to use that same passion and zeal and fury toward God in praise, passionate praise, because he deserves that and so much more. So much more. He has made a way. He has made a way for you to get made right. He has made a way for you to be a clean house. He has made a way where there was no other way. That's how much he loves you. That's how passionate God is about you. He held nothing back. Nothing back. So Jesus, this morning, help us to shake off once and for all sin that entangles and ensnares me. Help me to shake it off. And if you have to physically do that as a prophetic act, just shake it off. All this weight. Pick up off your shoulders all that weight of people's opinions. All the things that people say you should be and say you should do and say you should act. Take off that fear of man once and for all. Shake off that sin that so easily entangles and ensnares. Because that's not who you are. Rise up from the ashes because you are a new creation. Brand new creation. The world's never seen anything like you before. Woo! But they are about to see the you that God created. And they are going to be in awe of the God who created you. It is time to find our identity as a child of God. You are dearly loved. You are highly valued and treasured. You are accepted even in your sin. You are accepted. God is not against you. He is for you. And he does not treat us as your sins deserve. He treats us as royalty. Sons and daughters of the King of Kings. So let's rise up and act like it. Let's rise up. Find who he created us to be and start living out that purpose. So that we have an intention in life. So we're not just bumping through life anymore. We have a focus and we set our face like flint toward it. So that nothing will shake us. Nothing will discourage us. We just, all depression in Jesus' name, all anxiety caused and inflicted by fear of man has got to go from every life here in Jesus' name. Because there is a confidence in the light of Christ. He wants to shine his light into every part of your life because he's not ashamed of you. So why ought you be ashamed of you? He loves you. Perfectly and wholly and completely. He started a good work. Let's let him finish it. Yeah. I could go on and on and on. This could be a good old prayer service here. I would. 
We just thank you so much, God, that you care about us so much, and you love us so much. Every detail of our life, before we were born, and as we go, Lord, you care so much about every single thing. Lord, and we just thank you today that we can surrender our lives to you, Lord, knowing that we can trust you with every bit of it and more. Lord, we thank you for the creation that you have made. We thank you that we're made to worship you, and God, that we had the opportunity to do that. Lord, continue to bless each heart here. Speak to us now, Lord, through this song. Have your way. Thank you. It's amazing to think there in the beginning, as the Spirit was hovering over the waters, and all that God had to do is speak, and everything came into existence as we know it. And it's able to sustain itself and to continue that what God spoke is able to persevere through all opposition. But when he created us, we were made different. He went down into his creation. He formed us out of mud. And he personally breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And now even now, his creation responds to his voice. Continuing in how he has created us. That everything has a purpose, that everything has a time, including you and I. God of creation, there at the side, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonders of And as you see a hundred billion galaxies of more in the vapor of your breath, the planet's soul. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. I 
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. That's right, he sings the dances over you. Of deliverance, 
from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Declare it. I'm no longer. mother's womb, you have chosen me, love has called my name, I've been born again, into your family, your blood flows through my veins, I'm no longer Forgive us for any area of doubt. Yes. From this day forward, Lord, we will stand on the truth of who you yes. say we are, yes. Lord. Yes. And that is who we will become. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. Who am I?
Thank you for your truth. Thank you that you are for us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. We are not forsaken. Yes, you are faithful. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, I just pray for each heart, Lord, in this room, Lord, that anyone that's holding on or believing that, that, that they're under a punishment or some sort of um, repercussion from something they maybe did or didn't did wrong or something in their own heart or mind that the condemnation there is none for those who are in Christ and so I just pray for the heart that, that thinks that they're having to walk a punishment or something like that Lord we know that you are for us Lord that you clean our slate Lord that your blood paid for every single sin so I just pray for each heart, Lord, that maybe thinks that's okay, and I'm going to accept that, and that's, that's just my road. That's what i got to walk because of this or that. That's false. We, we speak truth. Jesus died for that sin, whatever it is that you're trying to condemn, be condemned by, and that is not your road to walk. Walk the freedom road. Walk the road following the Lord because he wants to set you free, and he already did it. He did it. It's paid. Walk it. Believe it. See it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blood that did cover all of those sin. Every single thing. We don't have to be condemned by that because we are free in Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom road that is walk, that is going to be walked by those that choose you, Lord. Help them to see it and walk it because it is theirs to have. Not to continue to beat themselves up or whatever the enemy is doing in that no it's time to walk the free road that God paved for you thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you that you didn't forsake us that we don't have to be punished by something because you paid a highest price for that thank you Lord that your blood covers it all and your love is perfect and unconditional forever thank you Jesus thank you Hallelujah. You are good. You are good. You are worthy of all praise, Lord. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for taking it all. Hallelujah. 
Take one more time. It's time to declare and proclaim the truth. You are free. Yes. I feel like there are some things that are still lingering on, still holding on to you. You're still tangled up in it. It's time to shake it off. You are free. Yes. That thing that tangled you up yesterday, yes. it doesn't have a hold of you anymore. need of prayer, please come forward. If you're in need of prayer for anything, we just want to stand with you, declare his truth over you.